Um, so I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, it's the first time Me we've too. actually met. Yes. But I knew as soon as I saw that book title that uh, you were sassy (laughs) and that this was going to be fun. So I'm wondering if you can just share a little bit about why that title. Oh, well, I think that there's a sexual double standard that I, I wanted to expose such that would we ever call a man hormonal? If we did, would it keep him out of the White House? <laughs> it probably wouldn't. But you have to ask yourself, you know. You know, and so if people are concerned that, you know, a hormonal woman, a woman who's going through menopause will, you know, pick up the red phone and bitch out the Kremlin, is triggering nuclear holocaust. Um, but then I, the question that I have is, well, who put the red button there in the first place? Um, You know, so I think that there is this sexual double standard um, whereby we think that women have lost all of their rational faculties and gone nuts if they are influenced by hormones, whereas we don't really think the same thing about men. So I wanted to expose that, and I also wanted us to have the opportunity to reclaim the term hormonal. So in the same way that queer has been reclaimed by gay people, fat has been reclaimed by fat people, Hormonal should be reclaimed by all of us. So that's the, the, that is where the title came from. I love it. That's fantastic. And I know that you've been researching this for so long, and you've written a ton of like academic research mm-hmm. papers. And I'm guessing, I mean, I'm a researcher myself, so I know those papers can tend to be a little dry, a little straightforward. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it like to write this book for, for all of us? Well, it was a lot of fun. I, there's a, there are a lot of personal anecdotes. Some of them are kind of juicy as a teaser. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so there were the personal anecdotes. I talked about, you know, getting pregnant with my kids and what my, the postpartum period was like. I talk about variations in attraction that drove me to this topic in the first place that I noticed back when I was in graduate school. So... I live both in fear and anticipation of the person that I write about, finding out who he is. (laughs) You don't write about him in your academic papers? No, 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 no. He was a colleague and and a friend and never somebody that I was involved with. But I had this incredible, incredibly memorable experience where I noticed that, you know, I'd never really noticed him before, and certainly, you know, he was just a friend and he was a colleague. But one night we were all at a party in Austin, where it's pretty hot, um, and everybody smelled ripe, let's just say. Uh, and I know, but I noticed that his body scent was you know, and he must have ridden his bike to this party because it was strong. It was like spicy, pine needly, musky scent. And I noticed that some people are making faces. Um, and I, but I noticed that it was surprisingly attractive to me. Um, and then, you know, which it ordinarily would not have been, then a paper was published soon after showing that women preferred the body odors of different kinds of men depending on where they were in their cycle. And that looked like a very strong parallel to the non-human animal research as well. And, you know, everything sort of clicked on high fertility days of the cycle. So that's about day 14 and a few days before that. We, our, our sexuality gets turned on in some ways. And so the things that non-human animals might find sexy, dominant behavior, um, you know, a bigger body size. Human females also tend to find more attractive. And so there's this, there's also, there are also these scent cues. And so everything's clicked. And I thought the, the standard wisdom that humans have no changes across the ovulation cycle that we have been, and this is the scientific term that gets used, emancipated from hormonal control. 
um, and I like to use these scientific terms because they just show how silly we are in you know inventing these fancy words. Um, I just thought that, that that did not seem right. And so there was this one paper um, and a few other tantalizing bits of evidence. And so I decided to explore this topic more because it seemed to me that the reproductive consequences, the you know, and so thinking about this from an evolutionary perspective, um, how your behavior change, you know, how why wouldn't evolution design our minds to take into account where we are in our hormone cycles because the reproductive costs and benefits and reproduction is the engine of natural selection. Um, the reproductive costs and benefits are highest on those high fertility days of the cycle. So that's how I started this endeavor. That was about 20 years ago. That makes so much sense. I always think research is informed by personal experience and I love hearing how you shape that. And also as like a sex coach, I think I always ask people, are you, are you the type of person that likes your partner like not showered or showered? <laughs> and now I've got the layer of like, and what point are you in your cycle? This, this <laughs> yes. might be informing it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you also mentioned in your book something that, or we were even talking about this downstairs, how you were surprised as you started digging into this and digging into the research, how much of the historical research has been focused on men mm -hmm. and men's behavior versus mm -hmm. women and women's behavior. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, I think it's actually a more general phenomenon where the males have been studied more than females across different species. Um, and so much so that, that males are sort of considered, so there are, there are two points to make. One is with respect to sexuality. Um, early researchers in this area several decades ago thought that um, male sexuality was more complicated and more interesting than female sexuality. Um, and oh, so, that's funny. I know, I think that's <laughs> funny too, I must say. And so studied males and males, you know, approaching females and just assumed that females would just be sort of, you know, like there, you know, and when they would enter this estrus period, they would have sex with, with whichever male was available. And that's, that is what happens in the lab. If you confine a male and a female to a cage, I mean, what choice does she have? She doesn't have an alternative. So, you know, she's like, I eh, don't want to become a, re uh, you know, an evolutionary dead end. So I might as well, or, you know, and I don't want to, you know, fight him off constantly. So, so that's, that's really the way it looked. So that's the way it looked in rhesus monkeys. That's the way it looked in rats and mice. And then researchers, um, some of whom, most of whom, I think, were female researchers, started to question that and say, you know, I think that females are exercising more volition here. It's not just that, you know, females are going to accept whichever male comes along when they are in this estrus period. Instead, they are going to choose different kinds of males. So then you, you follow the rats into their natural habitat and you see that they are choosing different males at different points during their estrus cycle. So the first male and the last male that a female mates with will sire, will have, will be the genetic father of the most pups. Um, and females are controlling this. So they have burrows with lots of winding tube-like things, you know, but they're in, they're not tubes like our hamster friends. Um, and, and so they're timing their matings in order to um, control who is the father of their offspring. So th those were some of the things that, that was one thing that was discovered. So it's like, you know, humans, um, so anim anim female animals are um, controlling more than we have given them credit for. The same thing is true in dogs. So a fam very famous researcher, and this is a male researcher, his name is Frank Beach. Um, who was a pioneer in studying ovulatory cycles. Um, he discovered by, I think, happenstance that if you tie a male to, you know, if a male is on his, is, is tied to a stake, so he's got his leash tied to a stake, the female, when she's an estrus, will run over and 
he could only chase her so far before he ran out of rope. Um, and she would be like, if you can't chase me, I am not interested. And one of the things that I love about this research is the title of the presidential address that Frank Beach gave. This was back in the 70s. Um, you may know, I don't know, some of you might be city dwellers and might not know this, but you may know that, that dogs end up in a copulatory lock uh, at the end of mating, and that, so, that's a, so that seminal fluid will fully transfer from the male to the female. And he studied beagles, and the title of his presidential address was Locks and Beagles. <laughs> I know it's awful, but it's kind of fun. So you, you mentioned some of this, this historical research that was done a lot with animals, and then you've done a lot of research with, the, with humans, mm -hmm. and, and what happens throughout, you started alluding to it, what happens throughout women's fertility, fertility cycle. What were some of the things that, that you found in terms of what do we do when we're ovulating? What, how do we behave differently? So uh, the first findings from my lab that got me going on this and that made me want to pursue this all the more um, showed that women who were partnered with... Uh, so, so women's attractions changed across the cycle. And in particular, they noticed other men on high fertility days of their cycle more. But that was a little bit dependent, or mostly dependent, on what kind of partner they had. So if, they're, if they would say about their partner, you know, he's really nice, but he's not the most sexually attractive guy around. Um, those were the women who's, who started to sort of look around more on high fertility days of the cycle, including so when, I, when I notice all the bad boys in town. Is that what happens? That's right. <laughs> yes. It's, so it's it's sexual attractiveness mm -hmm. has um, more of a pull when we're on these high fertility days of the cycle, and so we might have it in our long term partner, or we might look around, which doesn't mean that women are always going to pursue those attractions, but they are definitely noticing other men, and they are reporting that they flirt with other men more. Yeah, I remember you said, the, yeah, they're noticing, they're flirting, they're even, like, dressing potentially different during right. that Right, so there, there are sort of two spheres of research. One is about women's attractions and how their sexuality changes, and then another is how other people are responding to women. Um, and that women, you know, are, it, it looks like they are um, doing some things to enhance shopping around. So they wear more attractive clothing to the labs. We photograph women at high and low fertility phases of, of their cycle. I thought that this study was not going to work. I thought there was no way. There are so many things that dictate what an undergraduate is going to wear on a particular day, like whether she has an exam or whether she has a job interview. But we found that on high fertility days of the cycle, women were rated as wearing more attractive clothing than on low fertility days of the cycle. Um, so that's one, one phenomenon that we observed. Another one is... Um, should I talk about this the armpit this study? One. Yes, I definitely mm. want to hear about that one. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in, in non-human species, scent is a powerful cue of where a female is in her ovulatory cycle. It turns out that uh, in human females, too, we, so w the way we did this, it's been done in a couple of different ways, and I'll tell you about two of them. But the way we did this was we had women come into the lab, wear gauze pads affixed under their underarms on high and low fertility days of the cycle. We froze them all in the freezer, and then we defrosted them, put them in little plastic bottles, and we had men come in and smell them. And they rated, I know, I, you guys are grimacing. Um, and, and men rated the high fertility body odors as more attractive. And that's something that's a fairly robust finding in the literature. Um, one of the early pioneering studies, this was published back in the 1970s, that gave us the clue 
that there might be changes in body odor actually collected vaginal secretions. So we didn't go quite that far down south to do our research, um, but, but others have. And those secretions are rated as more attractive on high versus low fertility days of the cycle. Well, and you make the point, I mean, you're an evolutionary scientist, so you're looking at, you're looking at what's happening and, and making some, some statements about why that might be. So why, why might that be happening? Um, well, uh, I think that, um, you know, our, our signs of, our outward signs of ovulation are much more subtle than they are in a lot of other species. So if you look at chimpanzees, um, baboons, they have sexual swellings, and they're, they're very obvious. That's when we go to the zoo and we're like, Mommy, what is that? I know, yeah. I know. What's that, <laughs> Mommy? Oh, never mind. Let's go look at the bears. Um, it, so so we, there was this con contrast between what was happening in humans and what was happening in, in, in non-humans. I actually think that humans have evolved to conceal outward indications of ovulation. And I think that one of the reasons for this is so that th there are a variety of alternative hypotheses. But uh, one of the reasons is that um, women were able to preserve the power of choice if they were not displaying ovulation. Because then, um, you know, only the most dominant males would monopolize all of those females' um, reproductive cycles, and they would be the ones who would get chosen as mates. And it was probably plays a role in the evolution of pair bonding. Um, if women could choose good dads as opposed to the more dominant males, then they had more assistance assistance with um, our heavily dependent offspring. So you may feel like you have heavily dependent offspring. You may be a heavily dependent <laughs> offspring bit, still. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, relative to other species, females, um, human children, um, are. it takes them much longer to reach a point of self-sufficiency and reproductive maturity my ten within our lifespan. Not, yeah, my 10-year-old has not left the house yet. No, of course not. Mm -mm. No, no, and it'll be a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I ask my undergraduate students, I teach a class of, uh, on sex and gender to freshmen, and um, I ask them, I said, so, you know, how long does it take a human child to become reproductively independent? Mm -hmm. And they all kind of like look at each other and like, mm. I like, how many of you are reproductively independent and self-sufficient? And they'll kind of look at each other with a little bit of nervousness. And um, it's clear that they don't feel that they are quite <laughs> independent yet. Yeah. And you mentioned like this, this pair bonding thing. And I know you talk in the book about how we're a species that has, yes, sure, we've got this estrous cycle. And yes, we do things during that to attract um, a certain type of partner. And we also have sex outside of that cycle. Mm -hmm. And, and we yes, do it that's for this really important. pair bonding thing, right? That's really important. So humans have an extreme degree of what's called extended sexuality. And so that means that we will have sex outside of the fertile period, um, within the cycle. We will have sex when we are pregnant and a conception is no longer possible soon after we give birth and are breastfeeding, and in the menopausal, and in, in our menopausal phase as well. So we have an extreme version of extended sexuality, and you contrast that with what is called classic estrus in other species. So in hamsters, for example, hamsters are my kind of favorite example, um, hamster females will only have sex during the fertile window of their cycle. Um, and they, they do things to attract males during that time. But if a male approaches a female outside of that fertile window, that's it for them, right? Yeah, it doesn't go so well. Yeah. It gets ugly. It yeah, gets I remember ugly. being a kid and not being able to have the male and the female together. Right, no, you like, can't have the yeah. male and female together. And if you own a pet store, you would never ship the males and the females in the same box. Otherwise, you'd have brutal. a bunch of... It's great that we don't do that. <laughs> 
Um, you mentioned, so there's all these hormonal things, and I know I, I'm not, we passed the child thing, got a vasectomy, we're not on the pills anymore, but I was on a, a hormone pill for decades. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that impacted me in ways that I wasn't necessarily aware of, I yeah. didn't think about, no one was telling me about. Um, what have you found around that? And um, well, what do you want us to know about it? Right. Um, there aren't super great answers to this question for a couple of reasons. One is that I just don't think there's been enough research done on this. The, the theory is, obviously, if you're on a hormonal contraceptive, then that flattens out your cycle. It sort of flatlines your cycle. And so the ex changes that you might experience that would go along with a regular hormonal cycle, if you're not on the pill, um, will be eradicated. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And this is, I think, one of the really interesting things for future research. And that is that there are different hormone formulations. So you can be on a progesterone-only pill. Right. And progesterone rises after ovulation um, in the second phase of the cycle. And that is, progesterone is thought to be related to extended sexuality. So you might be more interested in your partner. You might be more interested in a partner who is going to heavily invest or shows cues of heavily investing in your offspring if you're on one of those pill formulations. Whereas if you are on a combined estrogen and progesterone pill, then you might get something that mimics more the ovulatory phase. And there's a little bit of research um, recent study from Norway that suggests that this is the case. So the answer is not going to be like a straightforward, mm -hmm. the pill cancels things out. It means that you'll choose a less masculine partner. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's more complicated than that. Yeah, it sounds like there's still a lot of research and saying I'm on the pill actually doesn't give you a lot of information because there's so many different types of pills That's right. or even so IDs I, or different things like that. Right. I can envision a day when women will be having this conversation with their doctors mm -hmm. because women mm -hmm. will go through sometimes a lot of different pill formulations because they won't react. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll have they'll have negative side effects, or they'll they'll feel like there are negative side effects yeah. as a result of using some pill formulations. Yeah, I definitely fell into that camp. I was I making up too. all sorts of things, like I wonder this, I wonder this. Let's get off of it and see. Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds no. like more research. Speaking of pills, there's also another type of pill out there. This is more in my my mm -hmm. area with with uh, in the bedroom. Um, yeah. And you mentioned there's ways in which you know a lot of research for men has resulted in certain products available for men, whereas women, it's kind of a different situation. Yes, yeah. so, um, you know, men have Viagra and Cialis to help them with some of their bedroom troubles. What do we have as women? So the, the bedroom troubles are a little bit different. It's low desire, mm -hmm. more. That's the thing that women complain about, whereas for men, it's maintaining blood. blood. It's blood flow. It's the all-important blood flow to the penis. Um, and so low desire might be a little bit harder issue to tackle. It might be more psychologically complicated. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what we do have for low desire and why I think it shows that we don't have enough research on this. We have a very sexy sounding drug called flabanserin. <laughs> And the problem, I'm going to run out and grab that right away. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like, what, what were they thinking? Um, this is the marketing team on, right. on Snooze. Um, <laughs> so flibanserin will, you can't, you can't, it will make you dizzy. So alcohol consumption is contraindicated, which is like, okay, so no champagne and roses. <laughs> I thought that um, was my flibanserin, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it, so it'll make you dizzy, it'll make you pass out, and it'll only make you want to have sex one more time per month. And don't you have to take it, like, every day, Oh, you have to take too? it every day, yes, yeah. right. So, Viagra's you know, you like can take on demand, yeah, so. yeah, it's like on demand, right. If you right. think you're going to have sex right. or if you are going to have sex, you can take it a half an hour beforehand, right. Right. and yeah. it'll work for you. So, Lots I think there is for more research. I'm so glad you're doing, you're 
more research and a lot of different topics because it's clear yes, that and, that's and not think, good enough. And I think that this is actually a symptom of um, one of the sexual double standards that I discuss in the book. Um, and so a lot of biological research has focused solely on males because females were viewed as too messy. So one of the things that was observed early on um, was that female rats would run in their wheels more on fertile days of the cycle. And so researchers said, well, let's not bother with those messy females. Let's just look at the males. And males were treated as the default. Uh, you know, if it works for males, why wouldn't it work for females? But even at the cellular level, males, male and fe males and females operate differently. So very famously, and this may be an example that you're familiar with, heart disease operates differently and the, the causes of heart disease operates differently for males and females. NIH, the National Institutes of Health, have revised their requirements so that now you have to have a very, very good reason to exclude females from a research study. Um, so if you're studying ovarian cancer or something like that, it really only applies to females, um, then um, you can study females to the exclusion of males. If you're studying prostate cancer, you study um, males to the exclusion of females. But that's changing, um, and it's in part because of the recognition that there are these important biological differences. But I think that that's one reason why we've lagged behind a little sure. bit. Sure, that makes sense. I think even you mentioned in your study, it's like trying to find someone who's not on hormones, like not on the pill, so you can get one type of read versus that. And it's, yeah, it sounds complex. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and there, you know, the, that this bias in how males are studied more than females even shows up in the study of genitalia. Um, we're all adults here, right? So I can mm -hmm. talk about this stuff. <laughs> um, so there are many, many, many more studies of male genitalia than of female genitalia across a broad spectrum of animal species. And that it doesn't make a ton of sense because female genitalia are not uninteresting. So waterfowl have these sort of labyrinth-like um, reproductive tracts that can shunt away the sperm of certain males um, and perhaps influence their conception with the males that they truly desire or who are more genetically fit. Um, so anyway, it's just another example that I think is a fascinating one. And I was amazed even just a year ago, there was so many, um, so much across Facebook and social media about here's what the clitoris really looks like. It's not oh. the little dot, right? It's this whole thing that's <laughs> right. somehow been missing from textbooks for decades. Yeah. Like, how did that happen? I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, Good information to have, Right, however. yeah, exactly. It's a really important <laughs> organ. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about some of, you know, like the, the earlier part of, you know, women's life when they might be conceiving. Of course, then there's childbirth, mm -hmm. and there's later in life and menopause. And, yes. and what have you found about some of those other stages of women's lives and how hormones serve us and, and help us? Right. Um, so I think that... Um, you know, so one of the major themes of the book is that, you know, hormones give us some guidance for confronting different life tasks. Um, and so people tend to think about pregnancy as associated with, you know, a dampening down of, of our ability to think. We have go into pregnancy fog. Um, but no, I think that instead the way to think about it is that we are reallocating really important resources to growing this precious being within us. So that would be about pregnancy. Um, in the postpartum period, we there are a variety of things that, that I have found totally fascinating. I had a, a postdoctoral student working with me whose expertise was in this area. And she documented what she called the mama bear effect. And so the study that she did, she had women come into the lab who were either breastfeeding, um, they were moms who were bottle feeding, or they were non-mothers. 
and she had them be confronted by an obnoxious gum snapping confederate, you know, who was being really rude to them. And then she put them through a task where they could engage in, at, for a variety of reasons, engage in aggression back and forth by doing loud noise blasts in each other's ears. And so the women who were in the study, who were the subjects of the study, thought that the confederate, the accomplice of the experimenter, was another research participant. Um, the bottle feeding mothers, when the confederate delivered loud noise blasts to them, um, I'm sorry, the bottle feeding and the non-mothers delivered lower levels of noise, whereas the breastfeeding mothers delivered the highest level of noise. She measured their blood pressure, and the bottle feeding mothers were like cool as a cucumber, whereas the other 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 uh, women were definitely getting agitated as a consequence of. So we're know, both their blood aggressive pressure. and calm when we're That's protecting right. our babies. That's wow. mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember experiencing this myself. Yeah. I had twins, um, and. I would be pushing my double stroller down the sidewalk, and a dog would, have, if a dog, a big dog approached, I'd be like, "Dog, I will break you in half." You get between <laughs> me and my baby. Didn't even come and just turned and went the other way. Yeah. The dog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He believed. Me. <laughs> I think there is. A, yeah, I definitely feel that. I wonder how that even extends later because I do feel sometimes I go into that that mom mode. The mom. Like, I got it. Right. I got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Calm, cool, collected, and watch out. Yeah. And that's right, yeah. right. That don't, makes sense. Don't, don't get between me and my babies. What about menopause? Well, so um, humans are one of the few species that have menopause. And that has posed a bit of uh, an evolutionary mystery. But here's how I think most researchers understand it now. Um, and that is that because our children take so long to grow into reproductive maturity, and they're so heavily dependent on us, at some point, it makes sense for you to consider reallocating your time to caring for grand offspring. So there are two ways that you can reproduce. There are two ways your genes get into the next generation. You can reproduce directly, or you can reproduce indirectly by supporting your kin, right? So your kin can have the same genes to varying extent, extents that you do. And so it's the, called the grandmother hypothesis. And so I think it's another example mm -hmm. of hormonal intelligence. Mm -hmm. People tend to think that you know, the system is broken, that you know, something has gone wrong if women are going through menopause. But I don't think that at all. I think that it's, it is a, it's sort of nature's way of continuing our line, but not necessarily by reproducing directly. Wonderful. I'm definitely relying on my mother this summer to watch our kids. I'm really glad that, that <laughs> she's down for that. Um, I know it has probably been a little bit difficult to go out and say some of these messages that that um, acknowledging that hormones influence influence us is mm -hmm. somehow like anti-feminist. Right. Um, so, uh, but I know you also believe it's critical to our empowerment. So That's right. How do you respond to these these naysayers? I respond with evidence. I respond with Love scientific that. evidence, and I respond with arguments too. I mean, it's, it's you know we think we tend to think that the hormonal stereotype is something of the past. Um, very famously, um, Hubert Humphrey's um, personal physician and political advisor said that women couldn't occupy positions in political office. And so we think, OK, well, that's, that's something that happened back in the 70s. Is it still true today? It is. Uh, you may remember the presidential debate where Megyn Kelly pressed Donald Trump on his statements about women. And then he, after the debate, said she had blood coming out of her, her, her wherever. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, really? In 20s? You know, it's like, eeh. Um, so so the, those, those stereotypes have not gone away. 
Um, and, and I think that a lot of people are concerned that by me saying that women are affected by hormones, I'll somehow be, the research will somehow um, be holding women back, smashing them up against the glass ceiling if they try to achieve and so forth. Um, and I just, for all of the reasons that I've discussed about the things that we don't yet know enough right. about, I think that that's a load of BS. Yeah. And, and, I, and I point that out. And I've been mm -hmm. very, you know, and so that's why um, I think that the book definitely has a feminist um, viewpoint. It's not the feminist viewpoint that says there are no biological differences between males and females. It is, um, as I said, a, you know, a Darwinian feminist viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I love that just the answer of, like, I bring data. I bring <laughs> data to the conversation. Right. I don't not talk about it, and I don't talk about it anecdotally, but I bring data to right. the conversation. That's yeah. my, yes, that's what I try to do. Wonderful. <laughs> And thank you for braving the political waters with that, because I'm sure that is difficult at times. Um, so I know we're about to open it up to Q&A, but was there anything that um, I didn't ask you about, a message you wanted to share? Boy, I think we've covered a lot of territory. We, did. we went through like an entire women's life cycle, right? <laughs> <Yes. Like laughs> very complicated. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear questions. Me too. Great. So we'll open it up. And we do want to make sure that you raise your hand and get a mic so that it can be um, recorded properly. Hi, um, thank you very much. This conference was very interesting. I would like to ask you the following. What do you think is, um, in everything you talk, um, meaning how do women get dressed or um, the level of sexual desire she has, what is really the influence of hormones in a scientific way versus just the psychology? You know, can you prove that? Can you, I like, can you speak about this scientific and data Part because I feel all of this is as well a lot psycholo psychologic, right? If, if you sleep well, if you had a problem at work. Sure. So how, how can yeah. you, you know? Well, so Thank you. We, the, the standard paradigm in my lab is that we compare women at, at high and low fertility points in their cycle, and we do hormone tests to verify that women are at a high fertility point in their cycle. Um, so we're fairly certain that it's hormone-mediated, and we avoid premenstrual days. So some of the things that might, you know, push the data around that we've known about for decades, right, that, that a lot of women experience premenstrual symptoms, something like 85% or more, the figures wow. in the book. Um, and so we avoid that, so we're just comparing two points that are sort of centrally located in the cycle. And we have these hormone tests that verify that, that it's on high fertility days of the cycle that we're observing some of these important And that's things. your way of like isolating, here's the effect of hormones, but it's not negating the fact that there are all these other Absolutely. psychological factors as well. Absolutely, right? yeah. I mean, the, the biggest effect on sexuality is whether it's the weekend or not, <laughs> whether a woman is interested in having sex. The so-called weekend effect it makes so much sense. It does. Well, we have a little bit more free time maybe on the weekend. Yeah. Um, and so there are a variety of social context-related effects that you know, in, including what um, the social norms are. So is it is it forbidden for a woman to have sex when she's menstruating or not, based on the social norms that she's um, accustomed to? So there are a variety of other factors, certainly. But um, because we're comparing these two central points in the cycle and we're doing hormone tests, we are, are fairly certain that, that these things are hormonally mediated. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Hi. I put it a little further so it's not so loud. <laughs> um, I have two questions. but. One is fine for now. So once a woman uh, goes into menopause, does it mean she cannot smell a man to be interesting anymore? Mm. And secondly, is she not interesting smelling anymore? <laughs> does it all go away? Well, there are a variety of things that contribute to body scent. And some of them have to do with what we think are hormone cycles. But there are other things, too. So. Um, 
there are genes that are related to our immune function, and we tend to be attracted to people who have genes that are different from our own, and that's thought to relate to offspring genetic diversity, and so that's not going to go away, because your genes are not changing. Your are hormones like are changing. pheromones? Is that well, word out there? Well, um, pheromones have... Pheromone has a very specific biological meaning. It's sort of like an animal signaling across the the, the, the tundra that you know that they're ready to mate. Whereas in, in humans, we we tend to use the term scent more because we don't want to make that leap. Of We're not animals. Assuming well, <laughs> well, no, we are. We definitely are animals. Um, so I don't I don't think that that's going to it's going to change, but is it going to go away? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that, you know, we went, one of the things that is really fascinating is that scent, the way a partner's body odor smells, if a woman doesn't like it, she will say, that's a deal breaker. That is a deal breaker. I cannot date this person. I cannot have this person as my mate. Um, for men, that's less the case, and you know we could speculate about why that might be true. But um, so certainly there aren't going to be the changes across the cycle because the cycles are diminished or gone. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other scent cues that we're picking up on and find attractive. Did you have one here? Hello. What are your thoughts on hormone replacement therapy? So I think this is going to, I'm going to sound like a little bit of a broken record. I think we don't know enough. Um, very famously, the hormone replacement studies were stopped short because they were associated with um, some of the clinical trials were associated with some maladies um, for women. But I don't think that means we need to st we stop the research entirely. One thing that we do know is that in the earlier phases of menopause, some of those complications as a result of taking these exogenous hormones, taking hormone replacement, are um, much lower than in later phases of menopause. So it might, you know, this, it's definitely a conversation that women need to have with their doctors, but they also need to sort of go in with their eyes wide open because a, a lot of doctors got scared away by those early hormone replacement. Well, yeah. it, they, they weren't that long ago, maybe about 10 years ago, were hormone replacement studies. This is not something that I've done in my own research, but it's something that I write a little bit about in the book. Uh, North American Menopause Society, NAMS, um, has recently released new guidelines on that because of continued research around that, and it is a lot more positive around it than it used to be in the past. I'll have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, it's a good, <laughs> a good new statement. Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Was wondering if men have a hormonal cycle or and if um, women past menopause have a hormone cycle. Um, so women don't have a hormone cycle at, when menopause is complete. So that's there's not a hormone hormone cycle. However, there are things that might affect women's experiences and might trigger certain hormones. So they're not going to be the same hormones that are that are going that, that are on our regular hormone cycles, but but there are others. Um, so when we interact with children, um, in particular our own children or our grandchildren, we experience changes in our hormones. Um, and there's no reason to think that that goes completely away. Um, so we definitely do experience hormone changes. Do men have hormone cycles? Yes. They're every day. My favorite stat from your book was the testosterone, being it's like 60% like higher than the rest of the day for the first 30 minutes of the yeah. day. And I was like, this explains so much. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it explains certain experiences that you might have in the, in the early morning hours. <laughs> I'm like, I need my coffee, I need this and this, and then it, it appears to pass us by, and now I know, now I know why. Yeah, it's, it's actually it's really fascinating. The hormone uh, testosterone goes down just very precipitously after waking for men, 
And there's been a, some interesting speculation recently about why that's the case. So testosterone has its pluses and its minuses. So some of the pluses, it, it maintains um, men's reproductive abilities, it maintains muscle mass, and so forth. But um, it, it also is associated with aggression. And that's one of the reasons why people think that the testosterone goes down so precipitously to keep men out of some trouble, <laughs> right? So you, you need it, and you so you need it to build your body and to maintain some of your body functions if you're a man um, and if you're a woman. Um, but then it drops off quickly right. to keep us out of trouble. Hmm. No, it, well, it, well, so the, 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 the daily cycle for men, um, it, it flattens out as they age, um, but it, it doesn't go away. Um, but testosterone does decrease as men age, um, as the testosterone replacement industry well knows. Um, testosterone goes down for men when they have a child. So when they have a, a new baby and, and potentially for longer than that, their testosterone goes down. And, and you know, that could have something to do with being a good parent and being, you know, instead of going out and trying to, you know, testosterone fuels um, sexual desire. It also fuels some aggression, we think. And so that doesn't sound like a very good situation to be a parent. And so men have hormonal intelligence, too. Okay, okay. We have a question here in the front. Very much. We have two. Here you go. Oh, okay. We'll come back. <laughs> so um, one question I have about when you talk about the period of a period cycle, mm -hmm. um, you seem to be testing two points in the middle of the cycle, what you said. Uh, but it seems to me that the cycle consists of like more than even two yes. areas, so right. to say, right? Mm -hmm. There's before, and then there's a peak, and then there's after, and then mm -hmm. the famous premenopausal mm -hmm. mm -hmm. situation. Um, I, and it seems like you didn't test it, but can you speak a little bit from evolutionary point of view, or like what happens in those other parts of the sure. period, so. Right, um, so the, the follicular period is like the first 14 days of the cycle, and that's building up to um, the woman releasing an egg, so the high fertility point in the cycle. Um, then after that, there is a rise in progesterone, which is necessary in order for conception to occur. And it has a variety of psychological consequences that are, that are really interesting. So we tend to be more wary of people who, you know, we might be more tolerant of in, in other cycle phase and phases, but in, so for unhealthy people, um, you know, people who just strike us as being a little bit off. Um, and there's a, a couple of different reasons for that. One is that uh, unhealthy, so, Progesterone suppresses our immunity, and that is necessary in order for the zygote to implant in the uterus, mm -hmm. because it is a foreign body, at least 50% foreign, right? And so progesterone also prepares us to, um, to, to avoid disease. Um, so that's a really interesting thing that happens in the, the high progesterone phase of the cycle. Um, premenstrual symptoms, what's going on with that? Um, it could be, so progesterone has, um, it makes us feel good, it makes us feel more social, and progesterone goes up right after ovulation, and then it goes down very precipitously. And so it could be progesterone withdrawal. And progesterone has been shown to be an effective treatment for premenstrual symptoms. Um, what's going on, you know, but then there are these other ideas about PMS. So if we, as modern humans, are having sex on a regular basis and we don't conceive a child, it could be that 
that latter point in the cycle where impending menstrual onset is, is occurring could be about getting rid of boyfriends who were, at least throughout our evolutionary history when we didn't use hormonal contraceptive, it could be about, you know, getting rid of the male with the unfit sperm or who we're just not genetically compatible with. You didn't get pregnant, get out. Or I didn't right. get pregnant, well, so get yeah, out. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, and so that may not fit with our current motivations. We may never want to have a kid, um, but, but it could be an ancestral relic mm -hmm. of sorts. Um, something you just said triggered uh, a question, and you said that when man has a baby, his testosterone level drops. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing a few years ago, and I'm wondering if you would confirm the veracity of this, that a daughter, a, a girl raised in a home with a man who's not her father, a mm. stepfather or mother's boyfriend, mm -hmm. reaches puberty earlier. That is if true. If that's true, and why do you suspect that's true? Because that's rather scary since that's a very common scenario. <clears throat> yes, well, gosh, I mean, pubertal onset is just keeps sort of going down. I mean, some of you may have teenage children and may have observed this recently. Um, so the thinking is that if you are getting clues from your social environment that men aren't going to necessarily stick around, so you have a stepfather or you have a single mother, then you should potentially speed up reproduction so that you don't get, miss out. In, this, in essence, um, you know, because if you only have so much time, and if you are, if, and if you, um, if you only have so much time, the idea is that you speed up reproduction so that you have many reproductive opportunities, and perhaps then one of them or several of them will be successful, as opposed to delaying reproduction, building your body, um, and then reproducing later in life, um, you know, in your late teens, early 20s, and so forth. So that's the, that's the idea. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is true. I would love to take a different argument. Oh, well, I'd be curious to hear it. Oh. Yeah, I, the, right, okay. Um, yeah, that's a little bit of a troublesome thought, but. <laughs> it, it, it does, does occasionally happen, yeah. Um, that's a possibility. Hi, thanks. Um, I kind of have a multiple part question. Okay. Um, I was wondering, so you talked about how attraction changes in different parts of a cycle, and I was wondering if that's different for lesbian women, if there's oh, any research on uh -huh. that. And then I was also wondering if um, hormones released during sex uh, is different for men and women, and also if you could speak about hormones released during breastfeeding. And then my last part of my <laughs> question. <laughs> You're going to have to remind me. Right sure, sure. the two-part question. Um, the last part is just, I was wondering how... Um, if you have any thoughts about how hormones impact decision making in life in general or activities. Like, I think I heard how if we sing together, there's oxytocin released or just laughing together. And so I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about um, hormones in life in general and stuff. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me what the first question was um, again. If, if attraction during a cycle is different. Um, for lesbian women. Oh, right, yes. Okay, so there's very little research on this. Um, the one study that's been done looked at women who didn't have an exclusive male or female attraction, so they were interested in both males and females, but those women did have a primary sex that they were attracted to. And what the research showed was that the whoever was your primary interest was who you were most attracted to on fertile days of the cycle. So, you know, it's, it's sort of consistent with this idea that sexuality gets turned on or sexual, you know, what we find, sexiness takes priority. And so whatever you find most sexy is what's going to take priority. So there's just one study. I wish there were more data along those lines, and maybe there will be at some point soon. Um, 
Next question. Um, <laughs> if if uh, hormones released during sex are different for men, men and women? So I'm not an expert on this particular question. Um, I, it is likely that, so oxytocin has, oxytocin is considered to be sort of like the female hormone that drives some of our relationship behaviors. So if your oxytocin is high, you do more to try and maintain your relationship. Um, whereas the male counterpart is vasopressin. So it's a little bit different, but, but serves some of the same functions. And there's reason to believe that those might be differentially released as we form relationships and potentially as we have sex with our partners. And then I guess the last part was just... But they're both related to bonding, I okay. should say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they're both related to relationship pursuit and bonding. Okay. And then the last part was just um, hormones and life in general or decision making or if, yeah. if, if, there's any, if there's any research in there. Oh, my goodness. So there are a lot of piecemeal studies that have looked at things like um, negotiation behavior, women's competitiveness with other women, and have shown that, so for example, women might be better negotiators when they are not on their premenstrual days. And they could come up with some reasons why that might be the case. Um, and um, and that women on, on their fertile days might be more competitive. So you can think about, so what I advocate in the book is that we understand our hormone cycles, track our hormone cycles, if we're still having hormone cycles, and understand how it nudges us so that we make better decisions um, about what to do in our lives. So if you experience a hormonal nudge that makes you all of a sudden notice the guy in the next cube at work and you're on a fertile day of your cycle that you wouldn't necessarily think that you don't love your long-term partner. You might recognize it as an ancestral relic that is best to be ignored, or you might just say, I am going to embrace this and have a good time. So it kind of depends on what your motives are, and that's, that's um, a lot of what I talk about. It's same thing is true for pregnancy and the postpartum period. Um, you asked me something about postpartum okay. as well. Oh, uh, well, I asked about hormones released during breastfeeding. Right. Um, so it's oxytocin and, and prolactin, and they're thought to relate to um, both sort of like the mama bear thing and also um, bonding with a child. Now, you don't need to breastfeed in order to experience those changes because just cuddling an infant, and in particular skin-to-skin -skin contact with an infant, will um, release some of those same hormones. But you get a more potent dose if you breastfeed. When we were in college, we always heard that women get on the same cycle in the mm -hmm. dorms, and then recently I heard that wasn't the case. So I'm just curious if there's been, if that's a, a, a I, I write a myth. about that. Yeah, I call it the myth of menstrual synchrony. So the 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 thing that we observe, and it feels so real, um, is that if we're far away from somebody in our cycle, then you know, we'll all of a sudden start to converge. But there's only one direction to go in. So it's a statistical artifact. Um, it's, it, it, if you measure women and they're far apart, they are going to come back together because there's only one direction to go in. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so, so it's, it's, it appears to be a myth. Um, it is accounted for by those statistical phenomena. And some of the studies that would have, like, some bigger and better studies have not borne out that effect. So it feels real, <laughs> but um, it's probably not. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm, I'm, um, I'm a little nervous about the person who documented that because I talked very favorably about she was the one who did the, the rats in their natural environment showing that they were picking their mates um, and timing their reproductive cycles, but she also documented menstrual synchrony. So I hope she's not too upset with me. 
So I was curious about um, hormonal changes and resilience to different stressors. So you mentioned how progesterone can can change our impact to inf- our response to infection, and I'm wondering. Um, I mean, one thing that we've noticed is if we look at um, men and females who have been vaccinated for flu, mm-hmm. um, so females mount a much higher response. But I'm wondering if we would break that down into cycle, would we oh, yeah. see some of that go away? And then in response to other types of stressors, like resilience to stress, the impact of a particular event, do you think that would be different at different points in the cycle? Women definitely experience changes in mood across the cycle. It's, it's the, the evidence, actually, I, I said definitely, it's, that, that was a little bit too strong. Um, but women feel more, they, they, they it's, I, I don't want to call human females rats, but it's like sort of the equivalent of running in your wheel more. Women get out more. They get out more, and it may have to do with mate shopping. Um, so, and they feel more attractive. So you could imagine how that might have impacts on um, well-being more generally. Um, there was another part of your question I don't think I answered. Well, we're very right. Oh, right, infection. Not yeah. Being Absolutely. I think that that would be well worthwhile. Um, and it really hasn't been done. Yeah. I mean, even, even if we control and trend our studies for male and female, we would never, I mean, we could force HMI in females, but we, we don't require that person. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that that's worth recording. Maybe if, you, if you're doing this work, are you a nurse? I, no, I'm, I was just doing some extra Oh. You should totally do this. It's a great idea. Because if our if our um, if progesterone is affecting our immunity, and, you know, because of the potential implantation of of an embryo, why wouldn't it have effects on other? You know, why wouldn't it have effects on our immune response broadly? Now, I have a bit of a philosophical question. Uh, Given that we talked about the changes in your kind of mood and, uh, you know, you can be a good negotiator or you can, you know, have all these, like, uh, different phenomena that I think many of us experience during the cycle, who are we? What person, what is our baseline? Who are we? Are we, like, the mean person in the uh, pre-period? Or are we, like, what is the true us? Um... (laughs) And then, wow. okay. <laughs> and then, like, I'm really curious. Then, is like, what happens after cycles stop? And is there like, is that our to us? And then, where do we end up? I think we have multiple us's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Does that sound like a cop out? But no, I, I think, I think all of those are us. Um, and as I said in response to another question, I think the more we understand what is nudging us around within our hormone cycles or with our hormone changes over the course of our lifetime, the better we're able to say, hmm, what are my, what is most important to me and what am I going to do when I experience these hormone nudges? And that's us, right? That's us. We have volition. We have the ability to make choices. So I think that's the true you. That's my philosophical, that's my, that's my dalliance into philosophy. Yeah, like there are many of us, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, like, when cycles stop, is, like, where do women tend up finding themselves in terms of kind of, I don't know, mood, personality, and all of this stuff? I still think there's a core you in there. I'm, I'm speculating. I'm, and so, because I, yeah, I'm not a philosopher, but... I, yeah, I mean, I've, having witnessed it in female friends and relatives, I mean, there's, there's still the core you in there. Um, so I don't, that's as much as I think I can, should say <laughs> as a psychologist and not a philosopher. Hello. Hi. I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. To what extent are these effects dependent on women knowing where they are 
in their cycles? Not. They are not. Because I can tell you that our UCLA undergraduates don't even really know when ovulation occurs, which is a little bit frightening. Um, <laughs> so we debrief them fairly extensively after a study is complete. And we ask them whether they know what the study was about. And they, they don't. They, 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 they don't, and they, they're not really all that super in touch with their cycle in any case. So they appear to be flying under the radar of conscious awareness, these effects. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I have a question about hormones in our food. If you oh. did any research about it, uh, which foods have the highest? I heard soybean has estrogen, yeah. but it's not true anymore. It's actually cow's milk. But I wanted your opinion on it. And what do these hormones in our food do with us? Well, so there's a lot of concern about certain plastics um, and how plastics might be estrogenic in their effects. And that might be influencing the sort of earlier and earlier ages at which girls are menstruating. Um, I am not sure about the soy issue. Um, I certainly have heard doctors advise patients to female patients to avoid it. So there, I guess there are differences of opinion about that, you know, based on what you, you've learned and based on what I've heard from others. But I think that it's an important issue. We have time for about one or two more questions. So raise your hand if you have one. Oh, here. <laughs> I just realized that I, I just remembered the diagram of the hormonal cycle mm -hmm. that I was recently looking at. And there was this middle bump of um, testosterone in the middle of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I, just realized, I don't think you said, or maybe I missed it, what do you attribute, what hormone do you attribute that? Um... So estrogen, estrogen is the is the one that bumps up high on those fertile, fertile days of the cycle. So you think that it's because of it, or testosterone might also participate there somewhere? I think that it's, it, in all likelihood, is probably some sort of a hormonal cocktail um, so luteinizing hormone is also really super important. Um, one of my colleagues who studies hormones says luteinizing hormone shouldn't be called luteinizing hormone. It peaks, you know, really, it goes up really high um, just prior to ovulation. He says it shouldn't be called luteinizing hormone. It should be called ovulation hormone because it is crucial for triggering the, triggering the ovulation event. And that's the one that we actually measure in my lab. Um, because it, it shows that really steep um, trajectory and peak. Uh, so that's the one that we use to verify that we've captured data during uh, the high fertility window versus the low fertility window. Just follow up. Oh, like in testosterone. Right. The testosterone. So um, testosterone in women is, there's... Um, some ongoing discussion about this, but testosterone in women is likely related to their sexual desire. That's, yeah. Yeah, and so some one thing that, that a doctor might prescribe for you is a testosterone gel that you can apply to your body. You probably know more about this mm -hmm. than I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or other sorts of testosterone treatments if women are experiencing low desire. There's a lot of debate going on about this in the UK right now. Um, not so much in the United States, um, but you know, people are quite concerned about it in the UK. And you can take a very low dose and escape some of what might be the negative side effects because you, you, know, you don't probably want to start growing a beard, um, which you can definitely do if you take a high dose of testosterone. Um, uh, so, you know, there are these low-dose treatments that show some promise. I was just wondering if why not just give women that cocktail, which is right there, and here you go. You have all, the, all throughout the whole cycle? Time, right, <laughs> the whole time. Well, you know, maybe the conversation will get started on that.
It's an interesting idea. So we have one more question over here. I can bring the microphone around. The question earlier about uh, changes in, in girls' cycles raised mm -hmm. by a, a stepfather, is there any difference with kids um, adopted or raised by a stepmother? Oh. Is there anything in like the stability of their home or something like that? Yeah, it's it's really, it's, it's limited to father absence in the literature. Okay. Um, but um, social stress can also have an effect. Um, so if there's a lot of familial conflict, if there's a lot of uncertainty, then girls will also start to go down in the age of, of um, menstrual onset. And you can, you can see what the story might be that would explain that from what I said earlier, that you know you kind of need to get on with the business of reproduction if you're getting signals from your environment that it might not be a very hospitable place for you to wait and reproduce later. I think we're out of time, but if either of you two have any last words you want to say, and Marty will also be signing books afterwards. So. Yes. Well, thank you for the excellent questions. I appreciate it. This has been fun. Mm -hmm. Thanks to both of you for being here. And thank you, Pam. Thank you.